what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Welcome, 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 welcome. Come on in. and puns. Let me just fix one more thing and then we can get started. But uh, please do like, share, subscribe. Put this in your socials. Invite people to join you this evening. Shout out to Vibe and Mark Anthony and my my mix. One of my favorite creations. Peace, Ricky. What's going on? What's going on, good people? Um, so so I wanted to do this real quick because uh, oof, a recent discussion. Well, actually, this is really sort of this is an ongoing perpetual issue. Uh, but but uh, once again, in my hip hop, in my world according to hip hop class, um. This and it, it's it's not this this central theme comes up a, a, a concern a, a a roadblock so to speak and no matter how I at least for me no matter how I think I have introduced the semester and the context and laid some groundwork it, I'm not able to to avoid this sticking point. So I'm constantly looking for ways around it and for help. And the the specific issue is the ability for advertisers to create wants. So the question of are consumers given what they want or are consumers wants given them? And for many or, or at least a, a a vocal component of most of my classes, most semesters, for ev- almost every year, there is again a vocal defense of either something that people want to call agency, or just vaguely describe as the consumer, we, the people, wanting what we get, getting what we want, as opposed to being made to want what we get. So I'm I'm always keeping my eyes open, and I happen to catch uh, this series of lectures, but this one in particular from Dr. Suit Jali, who we've had on the platform before. I've referenced many, many times. He's, for me, one of... Um, one of my favorite media scholars for a long time. Uh, I've learned a lot from the work he has produced through his own writing, his lectures, the Media Education Foundation, and uh, he did it again. He he did something else that has helped me greatly, I think. So, uh, um, so I want to uh, take a few minutes. I'm going to again step out of the chat for for a moment and and. Uh, share this and then I'll jump back in and then depending on how how, how much you all have to say uh, it, it may or may less be relatively short but it's also going to give me a way to work out what I'm going to deliver to my students next week uh, so I'm just going to have to amend 
make another sort of amendment, which is good because that's how I sort of structure my class anyway. There's 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 flexibility for for just this sort of occurrence, and um, so uh, let's see. So I'm not so I put the links in the show description already. I'm not going to play uh, any of the video. I'm just going to because as you'll see in a moment, I'm going to work off of of the slides that he puts up in his presentation, and it's also because the presentation he's giving uh, goes way more into the subject of advertising and advertising history and goes beyond sort of a, 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 um, a point I want to focus on for this class on hip hop. Um, and I think that'll be pretty clear in, in, in a minute and, and I'll look forward to the feedback I'm going to get uh, in advance from you all in advance uh, to to run in this next week, but I couldn't wait. I saw it, and even when I was at my daughter's soccer game tonight, I was putting it together. Uh, they didn't win. She played very well, though. She, I think, she played one of her best games actually, on a, in a losing effort. But selfishly, she looked fantastic. But anyway, but it also gave me a minute to to also f sort of finalize my my little outline here. So. Uh, I'm going to pull this up here again, the link to this, the, the, the entire series, actually this lecture, and then really it's like a whole series that you can get is all in the show description. Um, and, and more, including, uh, the link to at least one of the articles that I'm going to be working from and, um, maybe, uh, anyway, so. He, he starts in this lecture, he's talking, uh, uh, in this component of the lecture, he's talking about criticisms of advertising. And then he has another lecture where he's talking about the history of the defense of advertising, which doesn't really hold water, as he points out, and needs to be updated given uh, social media. Uh, and it's it's a good way for him to, to, to offer a balance to his bias, because as he acknowledges, and his, his work has always been about, he's, he's, he's looking almost very critically at the impact and history of advertising on media. And as I've pointed out, in, in many ways, learning much from him over the years, uh, uh, it's advertising that determines the content of commercial mainstream media, not not the interests of the artists or the consumers, but but he he here Jali starts talking about the work of the economist uh, John Kenneth Galbraith and raises the point that for too long the study of advertising has been conducted in the context of business and marketing. Uh, and economics, but not considered enough socially and for its social impact. And again, as, as we talk about all the time, uh, and as he talks about in one of the other lectures, uh, slightly differently, but making the same point, but whenever people are talking about Marx and Engels, uh, it's not simply an economic issue, as they pointed out. This is about how the, the social relationships in society are arranged. So he's so he he that is Jali starts bringing these questions in that he got from Galbraith, uh, and uh, in trying to assess in that, and we're answering these questions here: Why does advertising exist? How does advertising work? And then what effects does advertising have? Um, And raising the question, and in, in sort of in the context of Galbraith's economics question, which was at the time, uh, and I think is relevant still, why, as capitalists are always arguing, does an economy have to forever expand or grow? Why does there always need to be growth? Now we know that Marx, in 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 his work on capital and and others elsewhere, have talked about the the need for for money to be moving. It needs to circulate. It, that's why savings, and in and and uh, um, circulating dollars in 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 a segregated economy don't generate wealth because wealth has to. It only it only works if it's moving. But that's only necessary if you're constantly needing an economy to expand. What if an economy doesn't expand and is just satisfying the needs of society and the environment? Uh, 
you take away the you know anyway so this is that's sort of the the, the where where jolly is building this but uh as again the point in terms of media i think is important because it's it's this ever need to expand is connected to the the development and the military the the military aspect of the development of communication and communications technology uh, satellites going back for you know from the work of Herbert Schiller and and the expansion of the telegraph uh, being being and and the post office being about expanding the military reach of the United States across the so-called the, the 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 western expanse now we're into cyberspace outer space full spectrum dominance ever expanding looking for new territories to conquer resources and markets etc and so forth so if it but it's but it's always interesting to sort of stop for a second and ask well why why is that necessary what if we don't do that what if what if we stop doing that can't we just you know what what do we need to what do we you know so then Jali starts talking about uh, again trying to do, to evolve to this to this discussion of the role of of advertising and the purpose of advertising that the purpose of advertising ultimately as he points out is to create consumers for the products that society is producing in order to drive the GDP. Again, the GDP as a measurement of the wealth created for those who own society, that wealth is created through the production, the sale, and the exploitation of the labor that is involved in the production that precedes the sale. And then, of course, to to make all of that work and to not stagnate and fall apart, as we saw happening during the, the, the pandemic, you need consumers. So to to produce consumption and and you know and one of the ways that these and, and here's is he jolly is talking about the ways that these that this that this uh, is that this process is is justified the the defense includes that we that production is necessary because it creates jobs and then production is also necessary because it satisfies the good the 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 consumer needs that's always the initial defense as jolly points out as i think galbraith was pointing out of why we need to produce instead of instead of the the other thing, you know why do we need to keep producing all this if we already you know and, and as he points out marx has already said that that capitalism has solved the problem of production we can produce everything that we need we can also manage that production slow it down redistribute the wealth and that's you know, the advance of socialism and so forth but if if Again, if there's no need to generate all that wealth, we don't need to, 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 in this way, we don't need to produce and then we don't need to create consumers. So he's pointing out that this is part of the initial defense, that it creates jobs, that is production, and then it satisfies the the needs of consumers. So then Jolly starts to ask the question, as did Galbraith, well, what produces that demand? And this is where the the in my class this always becomes an issue. And I, and obviously I'm not alone. That's why Jolly is doing these lectures because this happens for all of us who raise these issues in all of our classes. Somebody, if not many people, invariably say, "Well, they're only giving they're producing because they're giving us what we want." They're referring to point number two. And even when you raise questions, inviting them to consider, well, how did you reach this number two conclusion? <laughs> how did you, wh where do you get that from? And even when there's an acknowledgement that there is no real clear answer for that, this is where they they get stuck because, of, of course, part of it is, again, the unconscious or subconscious defensiveness around, I'm not being manipulated. I am my own person. So this is where Jolly brings up what Galbraith offers as part of the solution. And that is what he 
and they call the accepted sequence. Okay, there's an accepted sequence that is offered in most, uh, at least for most of my career, and as Jolly points out, most of his, in in most media and communication studies textbooks, uh, to the extent that I've seen them in most basic economic textbooks, certainly the popular discussion all revolves around this accepted sequence. And the accepted sequence, as he's going to show here, is again that consumers create the demand and then producers produce to satisfy that demand. And that things are only happening because consumers are saying, hey, we want X, Y, and Z. And producers are saying, hey, you know what? We're only here to do what you want. So we're going to produce what you need. And in the context that I'm building towards for my hip hop class, it, it, it speaks to why do we get the kinds of music that we get or the kinds of films that we get or the popular podcasts that we get? Well, this is what the people want. And then even when I bring up the joke that I tried to bring up in, in, in recently in the discussion around hip hop and, and Ebro and all of that is, is, you know what? I, I don't know that many New York and, and, and other audiences in the hip hop, uh, uh, in, in, you know, uh, community who, who used to watch or listen to, to, to Hot 97. I don't know that I don't know that we knew we wanted Smack Fest. <laughs> Little I didn't know that we were asking. I don't remember everybody asking for. Can you please grab two sisters from different boroughs and have them smack the hell out of each other. And like, they, I don't remember there was this large, there was this huge clamoring for that, but yet we got it. So it must've been, so that's the accepted sequence. We get what we, we ask for. We get what we want. We get what we deserve. So as he shows here, this is the accepted sequence. There's a consumer on one end, there's the market in the middle, and there's the producer. And the accepted sequence says the consumer basically creates themselves as the market, and then the producer steps in to produce that which is being asked for. And in the accepted sequence component, the consumer is first or primary, they generate and become the market and they tell the producer what they want. And it's Jolly raises very interestingly. And this is what I'm saying about what comes up in my classes all the time. How do both, you know, it, it, two things, how do consumers both determine what they want and then somehow organize that? Like where are these organizational meetings and conferences happening where we all are gathered to not only determine what we want, but then somehow make that known to the producing world. Because as, as Jali is pointing out, we don't have an advertising mechanism. Consumers don't have an advertising industry that exists specifically and only to promote our interests to the producing world. It's the exact opposite. It is, it, it's, <laughs> and yet, anyway, and yet, it, it, it even to raise the question, because of the 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 beauty, and the the sophisticated delivery of all of this, and the time and the billions of dollars. Remember, Chris Simpson said, back in the nineteen fifties, they were already investing a billion dollars annually into the study and research into the research and study in the, of the development of the consumer of the development of public opinion and that and mass consciousness. So this, this, it, to, so to, so by today, even to raise this as a, as a question generates a defensiveness. For Galbraith, the accepted sequence cannot be reconciled with the existence of a massive advertising industry, the function of which is to create demand. And that's, that was Galbraith's, and again, Galbraith was no revolutionary. 
But this is the question. He's So he's saying, look, if we stop looking at this strictly as a business issue and something socially, it doesn't work. It stops making sense. Because how can you argue, just as I was saying, that I was just, I was just paraphrasing this. How can you argue that consumers are organizing their, de- their desires and then delivering those desires in a, in a way that, that impacts producers to create that? How can, you, how can you argue that that is the case when there, already, when there exists an advertising industry whose function is to create the demand for the producers? And again, I, I, Jali's doing it, and I'm definitely doing it as as I'm summarizing summarizing his work. But this is this issue of the creation of demand. He he goes into more in, in the into the in the video, but it's is it is itself a summary of this this massive amounts of research and and resources that have been put into that resource research that I was just talking about. They've in many ways earned <laughs> their liberation. No, they earned their their ability through exploitation and violence and enslavement and colonization and research and 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 imperialism. They've they've earned the 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 uh, the ability to know us better than we know ourselves, which is what many advertisers and he and Jali goes into this more in in, in these series of lectures. But through all of the data they collect on us, particularly by this point, and they had already begun to figure this out more clearly by the 1970s, but by today, with all of the data they collect on us, they, they, they in many ways do know us better than we know ourselves. And they can predict attitudes and interests and trends. They can encourage attitudes, interests, and trends with all of this data that we willfully give over of ourselves by doing what I'm doing here, by well, what we do just about every day when we shop, when we basically when we when we when, when our thoughts leave our minds, and even probably before then, they have already begun collecting and mining that data. And with it, they can do all types of things, among which, including which is is learning how to manipulate us, to create us as consumers, and worse. So then Galbraith and Jali, talking about it, develop what they call the revised sequence. Let me get to the point where it's all on the screen. Um, There we go. So... Atop here is the accepted sequence we've just been talking about. But the revised sequence, and this is where and why I'm saying hip-hop has, and I think I'll be able to at least partially demonstrate that this evening, but where I'm saying that hip-hop has, has perfected or is a product of the revised sequence. Or rather... It's a product of the accepted sequence is is really what. But it proves the revised sequence is really what I'm saying, which is the opposite. In other words, it's the opposite of, of the accepted sequence. Here, the producer, through advertising, generates and creates the consumer and the market in, into which the consumer consumes. So a little bit I talk about this in the second edition of or both edi- of the buying power my buying power argument or in work which is that art that piece that we covered in chapter 3 about after the second world war the, the the ruling elite realizing that they had still all of this productive capacity that they that they were using to make military and you know uh, uh, technology and weaponry etc they said we have all of these machines, like we have all this ability to produce. Why waste it? So we'll just stop making weapons and start making other products. And then again, we need to be able to sell those products 
we have to be able to create consumers. We have to be able to create demand for what we have the ability to mass produce. So I was talking about it more in terms of the, the ideological and the immaterial impact in terms of developing national identities and racial constructs and, and concepts of, of uh, you know, wedding democracy to freedom and capitalism to democracy and so on and so forth. But, but here the focus is more on how are we going to make sure that, look, we're not turning the machines off. They're just going to start producing you know, clothes instead of guns or, or computers for the home instead of computers for warfare or whatever. I don't know. But we need people to buy it. So we need to make sure that they know that they want this. We have to create their desires. So this is where, they, so he, as Jolly points out, this, is, this, is, this reverses the model where producers create the market and then the consumers who will purchase those goods. The role of advertising is to create demand. And as Stuart Ewan pointed out, one of the early scholars to study advertising in this sort of critical social way back, I believe, in the 70s, Ewan says, such social production of consumers represented a shift in social and political priorities, which has since characterized much of the life of American industrial capitalism. The functional goal of national advertising was the creation of desires and habits. The functional goal of national advertising was the creation of desires and habits. In tune with the need for mass distribution that accompanied the development of mass production capabilities, advertising was trying to produce in readers' needs, which would dependently fluctuate with the expanding marketplace. Advertising was trying to produce in readers' needs, which would dependently fluctuate with the expanding marketplace. So as I understand that, and I believe as Jali was pointing out, what Ewan is saying if we can create broad desires and habits, we can manipulate and tweak them as production and, and business needs and the marketplace fluctuate. I would argue and just add that, that if there becomes something, if something does emerge from communities that are clamoring for something, whether it is a particular product or again to the Vernon philosophy of black media avoidance to 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 self representation in popular media, then this apparatus can adjust itself and produce that in the context of the habits and desires they've already created as a baseline. So that's why if if they if if they they're they're paying attention and there's oh you want more black people in movies fine but we're going to give it to you based on the habits and desires we've already generated. So we'll give it to you in terms of black excellence, or we'll, we'll put black characters in roles that are traditionally occupied by whites with there being no difference other than the complexion of the, of the, of the actor. Oh, Queer folks want to be seen? Cool. We'll throw you in here and there, and we'll we'll put that in the same context we've already established. So these aren't queer revolutionaries you're going to see. Something else. And on it goes. And on it goes. And same thing with hip-hop. Oh, you've created this new art form? This new form of expression? It's not going away? Okay, cool. Start advertising sodas and cars. We'll start managing, as I'm going to show you in a few minutes, playlists, and we'll just kick in the payola, and then advertising will manage popular culture in the exact same way it managed traditional advertising. And then as Jolly points out, and again, we saw in the pandemic, without ads, the system collapses because the circular process of capital that must continue with the ad ad industry creating the wants to serve the needs of that of of that of that 
social and economic model, without that happening, consumption stops and then the economy collapses. And that's why, as I've been pointing out, whether in, in, in the buying power work, the top 200 ad, ad, ad buyers put out almost $200 billion annually. And overall, it's, it's, it's projected to be five $600 billion in annual ad buying. That's a lot of money to get after. And what that does is it assures, and I think with what I'm going to show here in the terms, it, it, it assures complete control over the end product, what becomes popular, what disappears. And that works for academic work, political ideas, ideas around identity, gender, sexuality, and certainly uh, pop culture and, and entertainment, so-called entertainment. All right. So again, I've 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 really limited Jolly's presentation to to the work I'm doing with with my hip hop class. So I've again I encourage you to check the link. the The entire lecture is really brilliant and and goes a lot more into the history of advertising, uh, and from the perspective of advertisers themselves, what they see themselves as capable of being able to do, which is, again, just as I was overly simplifying, they know us better than we know ourselves. So they can, <laughs> they know what they need, we need. So then um, it's a couple of years old, but this Wired article that I also put in in the, in the, in the show description, I think does a fantastic job. And there's a couple others I've been finding to, to update my own previous uh, exploration of this subject. Um, but, but spoiler alert is basically the same, same things are happening. And what this article is talking about is it's, it's arguing from 2021 that the music industry needs to be broken up to save the industry. And as, as um, Ron Knox, the author here, points out, three major record labels produce two-thirds of all the music consumed in, the, in America. North America, well, for, I guess we can, you know. And this, is, this, for me, is the key point related to what we were just talking about. That is, these three major record labels not only are they producing two thirds of the music consumed, it makes them the most powerful buyer of music and talent. So it's, and I love that the way that, that Knox phrases this because it fits perfectly with what I'm trying to do with advertising. Ad buying, the purchasing of ads is what determines so much of the content. Again, whether it's my buying power argument, which determines the journalism that projects buying power as some sort of real economic and political power when it is a business and marketing tool. They're doing the same thing here. By buying the, the art that we are to consume, having already created the market and the desire for us to be consumers of this music and art, they determine all that there is to be popular and focused on. I'm actually surprised they don't have more than two thirds of the music consumed. But again, that's two thirds coming from just three record labels. Now, I'm not going to do it tonight, but as I've done before and I and I will do it, it again with my class, remember these three corporations, Sony, Universal Music, and Warner Music are themselves subsidiaries of even larger conglomerates that are themselves doing this same thing in all kinds of other media and all kinds of other areas of the economy, specifically with this Blavatnik character who owns Warner. Is it Axis or Allied Industries that he owns? They are into everything. So, and again, Sony Music was only 6% of Sony's overall operation. 
and yet they're still involved. They're one of the big three that is involved with <laughs> buying two thirds of all the music and talent out there. And then it's, it's 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 as we could have predicted and did predict. I was, you know, as much as I wanted to claim I was, I told you so, and I was right. It's not something you want to be right about. Concerts, a crucial space where independent venues and artists have largely sidestepped corporate gatekeepers, are increasingly threatened by COVID shutdowns and the prospect that Live Nation and other Wall Street-backed giants will either buy them out or put them out of business. The broad middle class of independent artists, record labels, venues, and other small businesses must now rely on and increasingly pay monopolists for access to bands and fans. For some, the pandemic made a difficult situation impossible. Universal, Sony, and Warner Music suggest that there was something inherently anti-competitive about them. If you're independent, you're not looking to reduce competition by acquiring rivals or for other unfair advantages that tilt the industry towards corporate dominance. I like that line. I know this this is um, uh, an artist, uh, Darius Van Armen, um, being interviewed here but i like this point that he's that 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 is being made that if you're if you want to be claim if you want to claim to be an independent artist or an independent label then you're not looking to be folded in to some other monopoly he's right from the industry's emergence through the 1940s and 1950s there were no major labels there were just labels, numerous and diverse. Starting in the mid-1960s, many combined into a few much larger labels that controlled major artists and their recordings. By the turn of the millennium, just five labels dominated recorded music. Then, in 2003, Sony bought rival BMG, and nearly a decade later, Universal Music took over EMI. Consumer and industry p- groups pushed officials to block both deals, particularly because the power th- the combined labels would have over music copyrights and the distribution, c- distribution of physical albums. Antitrust agencies cleared both mergers unconditionally. In other words, the federal government let it all happen. And again, I was in a very small corner of this broader activist community back in 2003 saying, hey, this is a problem. And that's why in all these hip-hop 50th anniversary uh, uh, reflections and documentaries that they leave out all of this. There were these hip hop activists and others out in the streets and elsewhere making noise about, Hey, there's more consolidation. There's more, there's more ownership uh, uh, control and corporate control. And, and, and we're getting less diversity. We're getting more harmful and, and anti-black, anti-woman, anti-human forms of the mute. Da, 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 da. We were all saying that. And all that gets ignored for the in favor of the narrative that everything is good. Today, Universal Music Group, the largest of the big three, is so big that many of its labels, many of its labels, Capital, Interscope, Def Jam, have their own subsidiaries. Concentration is always a danger. That's why they are, they are, there are competition authorities, says Martin Mills, head of independent labels, Beggars Group, which includes Matador Records, Rough Trade, and other indies. The government ultimately, in terms of all of these mergers that led to this, uh, the Justice Department and also others looked, took a good look at this, and there was no action. At the same time, state's attorneys extracted uh, 143 million from the major labels and several retailers for conspiring to inflate CD prices, demonstrating the major stronghold on music distribution. So while the federal government didn't mind, the Justice Department didn't mind all the mergers, states' attorneys were able to extract 143 million, which is nothing. Because, because they were able to prove that already the consolidation was leading to con- conspiracy and inflated prices and all kinds of stuff. The majors still distribute more than 80% of all physical music today. Dominance is, that has proven disastrous. Warner Music shifted the shipping and storage of its records to a company called Direct Shot Distributing, Direct Shot Distributing which already handled fulfillment for Universal and Sony. <laughs> And the many independent labels that rely on the majors which to reach stores. So again, it, and then they talk about you have only three major labels with controlling eighty percent of physical distribution, 
And then they all consolidate further to use only one distribution company to do the distribution. And then as the article goes into, it doesn't even happen. People's stuff didn't show up. They weren't delivering stuff. So if you weren't among the biggest of the biggest artists, a lot of your own physical CDs or whatever didn't get anywhere. And this, as we've argued and shown for years, has led to what they said here. Major labels have, have helped greatly narrow what's considered popular music. Major label, major label artists released more than 90% of all top 10 songs over the last decade, and their dominance has drastically reduced the diversity in artists and sound that appears and remain on the chart. So again, as we continue to show in, in, in response to this, this defense of agency and independent individual autonomy, and, and I'm not being propagandized to, and I'm getting only what I want, this is how you create wants. If 90%, and I was showing the same thing, I, I, I was showing this for a long time. If, if you, we would go through the playlists, and shout out to Lisa Fager. She continues to struggle mightily with her, her and her fight against uh, her breast cancer. And and her comrade Paul Porter. I mean, they were they were essential to helping me understand this. And you go through the playlist and you see here are all the top songs, all the songs getting the most spins on radio, and ninety plus percent of them were owned by the major three labels. That it's not a coincidence, and then it's not a coincidence that that. To my students, I'd be able to say, and you like these songs, don't you? And most of them would say, yeah. Well, of course, because that's all you're hearing and it's put before you everywhere. And again, you've already been created as a, as a, as a consumer who desires commercial music. Because from childhood, every, every movie, every cartoon, every commercial, every radio station, every, every, every platform, every, everywhere is, is promoting that music are and then your parents are playing it in the car we're all i mean so we're already we and then there's of course the the natural desire for for art and music so when it's when it's delivered to us in this way that natural inclination being sort of satisfied we become again McLuhan's fish who don't discover water because it's an all pervasive environment is always beyond perception and then we don't even my students don't even realize that there's been a consolidation or that there's a reduction in diversity of artists and sounds that appear and remain on the charts. By 2001, and what they show here, um, well, according to data collected by Colin Morris, Michael uh, Varnum, and other researchers and provided to Wired, the number of new songs entering the Billboard Hot 100 peaked in 1966 with 740 new songs entering the chart. By 2001, that number had fallen to just 308 songs, and today it remains around half of its 1960s peak. So more technology, more artists, more diversity in art, more, 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 and yet fewer corporations are in charge, and we get less diversity and of, of ownership and less songs total hitting new songs that is hitting billboard the majors continued unchecked pop music dominance and is is partially the majors continued unchecked pop music dominance is partially the product of the time-tested blockbuster strategy of over investing in a handful of extremely profitable artists and albums but the majors are now more flush with cash than ever and they've used those resources to buy a staggering number of new acts an average of two a day so again, I love the way this article is phrasing it. In buying X, it is the same as buying ad space. It, det it, it, it assures that your product is being promoted. It also by 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 in in the it also in in so doing assures the converse that other products are not being advertised. In this case, other artists are not being heard, are not being introduced. And as this article continues, when we look at, at the consolidation of the platforms and the live venues, and what, what they show in this article, I had missed this, and I'm, I'm mad I'm, I'm a few years behind. It is truly amazing. 
And it shows again what Jolly was pointing out in the first half, that, that it is advertisers in the revised sequence of advertising it is it is it is advertisers who or or the major labels in this case who are creating us as the consumers for their product that they have to keep putting out and selling to keep capital flowing and capitalism functioning So none of this, as, they, as, as Knox says, would be possible without relying on the other twin tower of the music industry power, of music industry power, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and then they add Amazon and the other streaming platforms. So you got the big three and owners who own all of the art and all of the artists. And then you have the big really four on the other, the other twin tower and i'm i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to leave the roosting chickens <laughs> analogy just i'm just going to leave that floating out there since we're we're talking about twin towers of power but you got the 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 record labels the owners on one end and then you got the platforms on the other and then streaming through those platforms, which which Knox says single-handedly saved the music business, is making them more money than ever. From 1998 to 2013, industry revenue fell by more than half, from more than 14 billion to less than six billion, as Music Online abruptly called the very profitable sale of CDs. When Spotify first arrived in US in the US in 2011, skeptics abounded. Radiohead frontman Tom York famously called Spotify the last desperate fart of a dying corpse. Streaming, of course, has become the main way music reaches the masses and is in the industry's primary revenue generator. Analysts believe streaming alone will generate $75 billion annually by the end of the decade, more than three times the industry's late 1990s peak. Spotify and Google's YouTube account for three quarters of all streams globally, along with streaming services of tech monopolists, Apple and Amazon, four companies have near total stranglehold on the market. And no different than a century ago when monopolies in railroads, oil, steel, and essential goods controlled American commerce, when just a few companies control the power, bad things happen. That power imbalance has worsened the industry's inequity. Apple, Google, and Amazon are able to bankroll their music offerings through monopoly profits elsewhere just like by the way are the record labels umg universal sony and warner can bankroll their music operations because of their involvement in globally and all kinds of other stuff spotify boasts 150 million subscribers more than twice that of apple and its stock value has doubled during the, the pandemic. The stock market values the the stock market values the company at more than fifty billion dollars. In twenty nineteen, research group MBW figured that the three major labels each made around one million dollars an hour from streaming. Spotify royalties pay the bottom ninety nine percent of our artists an average of twenty five dollars annually. So a few people make a little bit of money, and everybody else makes very little. Per stream revenues are often microscopic among all streaming services. YouTube pays the least to earn its monthly minimum wage of $1,472. An artist needs more than 2 million streams. Spotify doesn't pay much more. According to the Tricordist, an, an average mid-sized independent label can expect to make around a third of a penny per Spotify stream. Streaming today accounts for 80% of all, of all industry income. As much as the service, streaming services need the majors, the majors rely on streaming revenue even more. Giving Spotify even more power. And I think it has, it, it looks like, as we're going to see here by the end of this article, it looks like Spotify has more power and more reach than uh, almost all radio combined used to have back in, in my day. And 30% of what of all that revenue goes directly to Spotify. Wow. 
This dominance means Spotify services like Spotify can charge exorbitant fees to labels big and small for the right to teach to reach audiences. In the pre-streaming world, a record label would typically get 70% of every album sale, while the rest went to pay all of the labor-intensive services required to make, distribute, and sell a record. Today, the rate is about the same, except the other 30% goes entirely to Spotify. Doesn't leave a lot for the artist, does it? In November 2020, Spotify announced a new program in which labels and rights holders could take a lower royalty rate as much as half, sources say, for songs that Spotify would then place into the radio algorithms it recommends to listeners. The platform's discovery mode isn't technically payola, a legal term reserved for direct payments to radio stations and DJs in exchange for plays over radio waves, but everyone wired interviewed for this story said it's payola by another name, the exchange of money, in this case reduced royalties for promotion in product in a product listeners believe is influence free. So again, one of the points I didn't cover from Jolly's presentation is that that Ewan and other scholars had pointed out for a long time that that one of the core features of the success of advertising is that it happens subconsciously. People don't necessarily realize to what extent their their lives are impacted by ads and advertisers uh, far beyond direct overt commercials. So, um, and in this case, most people, one of the ways it works, and I've made this point for years, particularly around this issue of payola, people not knowing that that the music that they're listening and that is promoted to them has been paid for by these labels is part of the process. And it used to be that it was legal if you announced that the payola had occurred. Of course, nobody does that because it destroys the point, which is to surreptitiously, subvertly, covertly, uh, uh, present your product, advertise your product without people thinking it's an advertisement. But the song you're streaming has been is an advertisement, is, is itself an ad, and is itself pr promoted to you as an ad would promote a product. And then as we used to point out before, that because ad revenue would often be generated based on how many eyeballs or audience members that platform was delivering, in this case Spotify, we are then we we are not only consuming advertising as consumers, but we are ourselves also the product being sold without ourselves even being aware of it. Because these these rate these music labels are paying Spotify and other platforms for access to us. Spotify is selling us, their audience, their, their subscribers, to the ad buyers, which are the record labels, as they are also promoting that produced musical product and distributing it to us as the consumer that has both been created as a consumer and sold as a product. I mean, it is... It is <laughs> so if Drake... If Drake's new single pops up in your radio feed, Lamb says, it's truly not possible for me to say whether it's because you love Drake or it's because it's Drake optimizing for a certain outcome or Drake's label paying to make sure that he pops up. And then if you end up liking it, it becomes, as Theodore Adorno used to say, it, us confusing like for recognition, or as the late great DMX used to say, it is, uh, uh, it is us accepting dog shit as barbecue and putting and putting barbecue sauce on it. So Kevin Erickson is represented the head of future music coalition. I mean, this, this is an organization. These are cats like, like groups of people that I used to float around and, and panel and learn from and watch. And there was always the political difference in that, that, that their focus is usually on, on the, the popularity of, of art and, and, and the payola and the, uh, um, the business arrangement of it, and and of course, I'm I'm always looking more to to talk about this as part of a colonizing project process. But it's just weird to again see these names coming back up, and once again in the same context, and in 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 a worse position because 
we're we it is worse now than it was 20 20 years ago Payola on digital services is a reflection of market power, but it also reinforces those services market power by the ability to 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 create consumers they are able to provide what they have created as a desire in those consumers. And then they connect this again to the live music venue situation. And, uh, you know, many small money, many, this article predicts that many of those, the, the smaller venues had, would have been wiped out by the pandemic because they were already in a precarious situation. Uh, that is not helped by the fact that, that, um, uh, a greater degree in consolidation has occurred in terms of, of access to venues. And I want to just summarize it in this one part, because for those of us who had been following this, you know, in my own work, I talked a lot about Clear Channel, uh, which was at the time in, in the early 2000s, the number one owner of, of, of radio stations. And then they became the, the number one owner of billboard space. And they became, you know, they moved into uh, what they called their branded cities project, where they could turn an entire city into your, your advertising space. Uh, then they turned. They moved into iHeart Radio. Then they moved into Live Nation. So as it says here, Live Nation's consolidation of the industry was rapid and aggressive, spending around one billion dollars in just eighteen months in the late nineteen nineties, buying independent concert promoters and venue owners. By nineteen ninety nine, when radio titan Clear Channel paid four point four billion for the company, then called SFX, it was the largest music venue owner and concert promoter. Antitrust enforcers took no an action to stop the deal. By 2005, Clear Channel had spun off its live music division into a new standalone company, Live Nation, the country's largest artist, manager, and concert promoter, and second largest venue owner. Live Nation has since combined with the ticketing monopoly, Ticketmaster, satellite radio monopoly, Sirius XM, and online ra radio leader, Pandora, as part of a media mega conglomerate, Liberty Media. Last year, Liberty Media was approved to take control of iHeartMedia the largest radio station owner in the country prior to 2014, iHeart was known as Clear Channel. The proverbial band was back together, antitrust concerns and all. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it's remarkable. Here we are, and again, all of these hip-hop narratives ignore all of this. Here we are raising our voices in protest against Clear Channel and consolidation and this, that, and a third, and we're, we're this... And and all of that history is erased in in part because they won. So of course they get to tell the story. And now they have more power and more ability and more control over more space, and the a greater ability to create consumers for a greater uh, for for more of to, to consume a product. They have more consolidated control over. The combined company could use its 850 radio stations, its monopoly satellite broadcaster, and its powerful online radio service to promote my, to promote live nation artists, tours, and festivals, all served exclus exclusively by Ticketmaster. Independent artists and small businesses in each slice of the industry could be shut out. They will be shut out. Tony Alexander, who's uh, an owner of one of the handful of black-owned labels, has been cut out of Memphis because there's no independent venues that he can afford to get into. And then worse off, independent venue owners also worry because Live Nation will begin throwing its cash around. Last month, the, last month, the company announced it's sitting on $2.5 billion in cash reserves and received received $500 million injection from Saudi investors in April 2020. Our twin antitrust agencies, the Justice Department and Federal Trade Commission, reviewed every deal and investigated, and investigated conduct over and over. Under both Republican and Democratic administrations, the agencies did nothing, and today the industry is more consolidated than ever. Similarly, Sony spent $430 million to buy AWOL, one of the few big independent distributors of digital music, showcasing the major's continuing push to control distribution beyond record, lates, record stores. 
and Liberty Media just completed the creation of an in-house blank check acquisition company, flush with more than $500 million to target a company in the media, to target a company in the media, digital media, music, entertainment, communications, telecommunications, and technology industries. So they just have a war chest ready to buy up more and more and more and more and more and more. And this is why we need political power, because we're never going to compete financially with billions and hundreds of millions of dollars that these folks have to buy up anything that shows itself to be a viable, independent operation. Our only, the only hope we have is in, is in collective movement building. So anyway, that's, that's basically what I want to show and, and, uh, and to put together for my uh, World According to Hip Hop class, because I think the combination of the two, to me, seems like it works well uh, in, in showing, in addition to some other things we're looking at, but I think this, this does a good job of encapsulating the, the, the ability, first of all, the need of an advertising industry to exist to create the consumers for the products that are going to have to be made. Because in this capitalist economy, there has to, going back to Galbraith's initial question, there has to be constant expansion. There has to be constant conquering of markets, the creation of markets, the creation of more consumption, the creation of more products for those, those consumers, and, and of course, the creation of the desire. And that's why there's a billion dollar advertising industry. That's why there is a billion dollar uh, academic wing funded to research how those ads can best be deployed to be the most effective. And in terms of music, it works the exact same way. We will, that is those in power will use the same marketing research techniques, the same uh, data mining techniques that are used elsewhere to 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 determine what trend or what what form their products need to take to be most likely to succeed in 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 or in what form that that message needs to take to create the the desire for the consumer to consume our our desires are not our own or, or at best, we have to ask, why do we like what we like and how do we know what we know? And we have to, as my former professor said, interrogate our preferences. And as the Vernon philosophy argues, become very critical of those preferences, and especially when we like something. Anyway, okay, so, th so, that's, so that's that. Uh, um, I'm going to stop there. I will jump in the chat if anybody has any comments, questions, queries, conundrums, catechisms, cacophony calumny consternation um but uh um so i'm going to ask the so i'm going to my so my students will be assigned to watch that entire lecture and then we'll discuss that in class and then i will put a version of this together i may even just show them this video or both but i'm going to but the goal is i maybe put a better version of this together for presentation in the classroom um to try to put those pieces together Yeah, it's ridiculous. I'm way up past my bedtime, and I need some sleep too. Because I have a feeling we're gonna. I, I think EYL is gonna be is is gonna be. I'm gonna need to be well rested for tomorrow morning. But I. But anyway, this was this was sort of fresh on the top of my head, and when I saw that that presentation, I was like, "This is perfect um, for for what we're for what we're struggling with." In in not really struggle with too much, but what comes up all the time. And it came up already this semester. Um, so. I mean, you'd have to be at Morgan State University. Man, what's up, Pancho? What's up, my man? I hope you're doing okay. 
so tomorrow we have uh, the first half of the show. We're going to be. I know we're going to be talking about uh, Killer Mike and 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 um. Did Geechee post this already? Did you all see the clip? Wait a minute. This this is. Let me see here. Oh no, I can't show the clip on here, right? Because it's 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 not. I can't. You won't be able to hear it. But I think it's it's the clip from Kalanji's interview where where Killer Mike says um, something like, "You know, I'm not calling you all ends. I'm calling you negus, n g n e g u s. Uh, but y'all, I'm not coming on y'all show because y'all still lames." The essential question, Lucy, was what is the role? Um, why is there advertising? And what role and function and impact does advertising play? Um, so the 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 essential the essential point was if there's no need that advertising only exists to create the wants and the desires among us or to create us as consumers so that we will buy the products that producers produce. And then I'm arguing that this is the best way to understand commercial rap music. Uh, it is, it is advertising that uh, has been, that is, it is both advertising and the product being advertised and delivered to us whose desires for that product have been created by the producers. Yeah, he called all of us on EYL lame indirectly. It's it's pretty clear though if you see it, if you see it in the interview it's pretty clear who he's talking to. So we'll start there. And then the second half, we have Dr. Mamira Prosper coming on to talk about Haiti. So we're going to, you know, we can be a little silly for an hour and then we're going to get a little more serious. Um, and a couple other things might be thrown in there too, but I think that's, that's, that's looks like the, the run of the show. Yeah, definitely check out, check out uh, Jolly's lecture. Um, and there's the you'll see the videos. There's a series of them. He's it's that he's been giving uh, lately. Uh, <laughs> no, I can't. I can't. I I can't pull it up because you won't be able to see it. But if you if you the preview I was going to show you is in Kalanji's interview. So if you haven't seen if you've seen Kalanji's interview, that's the preview. If you if you haven't, you can go watch it and get that the preview. Um, <laughs> a degree for being in my classes for two years. I appreciate that you think it's a degree worthy, but you know. Um, I don't know. I suppose, you know. Uh, anyway, okay. I think that's it. Oh yes, what's up, Two Black? Um, you know what? That would be a good point because it's the same consolidated industry there too. That's a good. That's a good point. Yeah, Negus means kings, but come on. But so you calling us lame kings? Come on, come on. Uh, anyway, all right, good people. I appreciate you coming through. Uh, please do continue to support the platform. Like, share, subscribe. Join if you can. Patreon, blackpowermedia.org. Make sure you have the bell rung so you catch all the great deliverables because we want to create you as an audience desiring our products. <laughs> now, I appreciate you. Thank you very much. Peace, peace, peace. BPM University, right on. Thank you very much, Coco. Waiting for your class next. Except in this university, you go from from faculty to student 
in a in a in an instant. It's is is that's the collective. Actually, that's pretty dope. Beyond the joke, that's pretty dope. <laughs> BPM library card. Uh, we do need to do a Gil Noble show. I got to get my man, Dr. Burroughs, up there um, for that. And we need to do one on List of Velt Middleton, too. Um, and, uh, um, but, and, and big shout out to, to Sin K. Brath from this morning talking about Gil Noble. Um, like it is is it was was amazing and uh, as a as a program the idea that it was on regular TV in New York is just bananas, and then getting to meet Gil was was great uh, as well. It is a badge, but yeah, earn your lameness. That's it. Anyway, all right, good people. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Go get go get rested up. And uh, as always, it, like Fred Hampton used to say, peace if you're willing to fight for it. And definitely if you see this later or come back, got time to think about it. Uh, I definitely want to hear from from you in your thoughts. So please put it in the comments. And, you know, let me know if it's wrong, bro. <laughs> All right, let me stop messing around. It's bedtime. All right, everybody. Peace. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.